United States Open is in the books. We'll tell you how we did with our picks. We move now, the PGA Tour, on to Cromwell, Connecticut for the Travelers Championship. LIV Golf, huge storyline we will discuss. NBA Championship, coach owes me a little bit of cash. And I panicked, and I sold a lot of stuff, and now I totally regret it. Guy Adami is going to help us break it all down and figure out how we can make our money back today on Breaking Even. Hold me. Somebody just hold me. I need a hug. <laughs> U.S. Open's the longest week of the year, but it's a strong week. Coach, how are we doing over there? I'm doing good. I loved all your coverage, all the social media content that you put out at the U.S. Open. I thoroughly loved it. Great champion. Great event. Um, it was cool. It was cool. So great job. I'm sure you're still exhausted, though. Exhausted. I told you a story before we came on air about misspelling uh, a name on my daughter's uh, friends for the swim meet. Apparently, King does not have two eyes in it. <laughs> I mean, I'm still I exhausted. I don't think people understand how long these days are when you do the digital content. Now, you're talking 10, 11 hour days. It's no joke. It's no joke. Yeah, it's no joke. And we love it. But at the same time, by the end of a 12 hour day, you're just eyes crossed and trying to figure out what's going on. That yeah. being said, this golf course, I've never even played it, this country club, and it's in my top 10. That's how good this place was. The history we all know about. But the golf course itself, just absolutely phenomenal. It proved, Coach, to be a worthy test. Well, I think I think what we learned by the end of the week is, is what we always say at the end of every major week. Man, that felt like a year. Man, Thursday, the first round leaders, that felt like a year ago. It really, truly did because it was kind of like three different weeks. You had the beginning of the week where everybody was talking about live golf and the guys coming to play the U.S. Open. Then you had Michael Wan saying, yeah, it's going to be tougher moving forward. Then you had the start. And you're like, how will Phil play? How will DJ play? Well, it's pretty obvious that the entire leaderboard was all PGA Tour guys. No live golf guys there at all. I think that's very telling as well. But then you get to Sunday, and I thought it was one of the great final rounds that you're going to see of guys that didn't shoot 64, didn't shoot 65. But the way that Matthew Fitzpatrick played and Zalatoris, that's all you can ask for. And how any player would want to walk away potentially from having the opportunity to play in that? I just don't get it. My I broadcast just... partner, Luke Elvey, had a great line. He said, we've got lightweights boxing and throwing heavy punches like heavyweights or something along those lines. It, it, yeah. uh, it's true. I mean, we had these two kind of slightly built guys in, in Zalatoris and Fitzpatrick and every other hole, it seemed like this back and forth. So Matthew Fitzpatrick, if you're living under a rock, he won the United States Open. He also won the U.S. Amateur at this same golf course. Jack Nicholas, the only other player in history to do that in, at Pebble Beach. Um, it was a stacked leaderboard. We didn't know who was going to win it till the very last second. But let's take a look at our picks, Coach, because uh kind of proud of these. We did pretty good. Okay. Hit them. What do we have here? So, so my sleeper, Justin Rose, had a really good first two days, and he yep. kind of backed off. But McElroy T5, we got close there. Uh, Thomas had a bad Sunday. So my picks were not great. I was happy to hit my best bet, though, McElroy over Rom, as Rom went backwards over the weekend as well. Yeah, surprising Rom on Sunday. I thought he might come out with a little bit more action. Uh, yeah, McElroy, boy, he looked the part, didn't he, until Saturday. Uh, he he got blown. He, give him credit, though. He fought hard on Saturday. He could have absolutely been blown out of there. Uh, Justin Thomas just didn't have it. I did hit a couple of the top ten. I had Salah Thorson, Fitzpatrick. Yeah. That's and then this, the easiest money all year. Sam Burns over Victor Hovland. I walked a few holes with Victor and absolutely love this guy, by the way. He's one of the nicest, coolest, most talented dudes out there. But I walked a couple holes with him, saw what was happening around the greens and thought, no, no, no. It I was <laughs> easy money right here. Yeah, I called him at the Zurich Classic. And I think I told you actually at dinner when we were calling. I said, this is the worst short game I've ever seen. So people, a little bonus betting tip right now. Even if the books have it, either bet against Hovland and Matthew Wolf or just stay away. Because right now they're going through that sophomore slump in year four. They're just not playing good golf. Yeah. And I love Hovland, so I'm always going to root for yeah. him. But, you know, business is business. Yes, it is. Um, and by the way, I think I'm just going to start betting Zalatoris to win every single time because at some point now he has got to get a win. He's too it's, good not to. It, well, he's got to fix his putting. And I think anybody that watched that on Sunday and we're I, 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 
I'm worried that he's going to turn into the next Phil Mickelson, meaning that he's going to be have all these second place finishes for years because Phil didn't even win his first major until he got into his 30s. And is Zalatoris going to be that guy that because of his putting, can't make a big putt when you need to, can't make a five-footer when he needs to. I was standing behind him at the Farmers when he had a putt to win in regulation. Is he going to be that guy? I'm worried about it because his game is great, but he can't putt. In that but he's, he's he's plus in the category strokes game putty in the majors. So he, he putts fast greens well. Now, at crucial times, I think the sample size is a little too small still to really know. But he made some big-time putts. You can just look at 13 and 50. Yes. I mean, he made some big putts coming down the stretch, 16. But he did say this one hurts a little bit more. So we're yeah. starting to see now because of the PGA Championship, it was all, hey, I'm happy to be here. Oh, it was great getting into the playoff. Now it's, boy, this one hurts. And, you know, and it doesn't take too many second place finishes to start to feel that way. So we'll see. But he's going to be an absolute bona fide superstar, and I'm here for it. He really lost it when, when Fitzpatrick three putted 11. He has the advantage now Zalatoris does. He has to hit the fairway. He's got to take the oxygen out of the room for Fitzpatrick, and he blows it way right on 12, and it leads to a bogey. That, yep. that's, you have to know the moment. Obviously, he didn't mean to do that, but you've got to know the moment, and somehow you've got to find that fairway on 12. Sorry, um, all about fairways. There's so much more to discuss, but obviously we do 30 minutes here on Breaking Even. So let's look ahead. We're in Cromwell, Connecticut this week for the Travelers Championship. Uh, and I don't know how these guys can play another tournament after playing the U.S. Open. It just, to me, boggles my mind. But it's always a strong field. So here we go, Coach. You're on the queue. Go ahead. Yeah, all right. So th this is one of my favorite tournaments of the year. Uh, my house that I still own is only 25 minutes from this golf course. I've played it many, many times. Love the Travelers. It gets a great field because years ago, the guys that run it, they're amazing. They started sending a plane to the U.S. Open mm -hmm. and bringing players back with their families. And the player's like, you know what? I really like it there. Spieth, one of the great finishes of all time at this event, out of the bunker over Daniel Berger. He's got a lot of history here. Patrick Cantlay, when he was an amateur, shot a 60 on this golf course. I think this is one of those weeks where all of a sudden he just pops up because that's how he wins. He just pops up. So I'm going to go Cantlay plus 1,400. I think Brian Harmon, this is a great venue for him. Not too long. You need to have really good shots around. He loves this place. I think Harmon, top five, plus 750. Jason Day had a good tournament here a year ago. I think he's in the top 10. And then a little sleeper who played really well, uh, Ned, at the U.S. Open, and he's been playing better as of late, played good at the Memorial. Denny McCarthy. Yeah. I'm into a top 10, top five, whatever you want. I like him to win. He's plus 5,000. But he's a great number if you want to have any of those uh, top fives or top ten. So I like all those. And then my best bet, Keegan Bradley. This is his second favorite tournament of the year after last week. I think he has a top 20 lock this week at plus 140. I love your Keegan Bradley. That's uh, that's easy money right there. Uh, that's a good pick. Uh, Danny McCarthy, agreed. I mean, this guy, he's due. He is the best putter on the planet. And yep. every putty hit looks like it's going in. If it doesn't, I like Danny McCarthy. I think that gives him a ton of confidence coming out of the United States Open. I don't know about Jason Day. I understand plays this place well, but I don't know where he is right now uh, mentally. Harmon, yeah, Bulldog, Cantley. I haven't liked what I've seen out of Cantley over the past couple of weeks. I know he finished well at the Memorial, but it felt like he found a Band-Aid kind of Friday afternoon that lasted him throughout the weekend. That's why I picked him. That's exactly yep. why I picked him because that's how he does it. He just kind of goes along. Then all of a sudden he has a great week like he had with Xander at the Zurich. Uh, long shot for me, Luke List. He's not winning this tournament, but he plays well on soft conditions with uh, kind of bent POA mix uh, and a big hitter of the ball. You always get some rain this time of year up in Cromwell, so you know you're going to have to carry the ball a long way. So he was my pick just based on distance alone. Top 10, Davis, Riley, Aaron Wise. Watch out for Aaron Wise. This kid's going to have a big summer. I talked to he and talked to his coach, Jeff Smith. His swing, he finally said, is where he wants it. Again, this remember, this guy won the NCAA championship at Oregon. He hits it a mile. He hits it straight up in the air, and he's finally starting to putt well now using his old college coach's long putter and Casey Martin. Right. Davis Riley, this guy is great. And we're going to talk about Liv because there's some chance Davis is <laughs> – bye-bye. Jordan Spieth, uh, we're going to see. Just because he plays well here, you got to pick him. And Rory McIlroy, again, long hitter, hits it high, putting so well, so you got to go with him. My favorite bet, it's supposed to be Brant Snedeker – first round leader i think again give me a little grace after the u.s open here i think i forgot to put that part in for for our main man the snedeker first round leader but i'll take him to win at that those odds sure why not 
All right, I don't mind any of these picks, to be honest with you. The one that I really don't like is your McElroy outright, and, I, and there's yeah. two reasons why. A, it's below minus 1,000, and I hate betting. I would never bet that, but that's why I wouldn't bet if I was a fan at home watching the show. But number two, and probably a bigger reason why, is he just won a Canada two weeks ago. Last week, he was the face of the PGA Tour at the U.S. Open. He just was. And every single day, he was asked about Live Golf, and – he answered every single question. I think he's going to be exhausted this week. And I think by the time we get to Sunday, he could be in contention, but I don't think he'll have enough energy uh, to finish the job. He's going to be asked about it again because yeah. Liv is preparing for their second event. They're out in Portland, Oregon. Abraham Answer is reportedly going. Brooks Kepka this morning is reportedly going. I don't, again, I can't confirm that 100% until they actually put a peg in the ground and tee off. But neither of those would surprise me. And then there's some other pretty big names that are being floated around. So, yeah, Roy McIlroy is going to continue to be asked about. It. He's going to continue to be the face of the tour. But, Coach, this Lyft tour, it's gaining a little bit of steam. It's gaining some credibility now with the players that are involved in it. Are, are you nervous? Are you worried about this thing? No, I'm, I'm not nervous at all. And, and I know other people and, and really close friends of mine are. And I'm going to tell you why. Just with my experience in the entertainment world and the sports world, it's extensive. And there is no substitute, period, for star power. And let's just look at the players that have gone. They've gone after names that are no longer stars on the PGA Tour. And what I mean by that is this. Brooks Kepka never, never prioritized PGA Tour events. Never. It was always, warm-ups. A, always a, yeah, they were warm-ups. I don't yeah. I don't. All right. I, I, I practice at the tournament uh, events. Remember when he used to say that? I practice when I get there. Yeah. He doesn't play golf. DJ said last week to a, a reporter, almost incredulous that he'd be asked this. He's like, the whole point is, and he laughed. He went, <laughs> the whole point is to play less golf, which is exactly what Liv wants to hear, right? Exactly what fans at home who are going to pay $85 a ticket to go watch these guys play golf want to hear. Oh, don't worry about us. We want to play less and make $200 million. I don't know anybody that gets paid to work less, but is this really work too? So Brooks doesn't doesn't surprise me, doesn't even make me blink. Abraham answer, even less. Answer is not a guy that you can build yourself around. Now, is he big in, in Mexico? Yes. But is he somebody that anybody talks about when they're going to a tournament and say, I got to go watch Abraham answer today? The answer is a resounding no. So when you look at all these big names, Ned, Patrick Reed, Brooks Kepka, DJ, Phil, Abraham Answer, Louis Oosthuizen, Ian Poulter. They all have something in common. Over the hill, haven't won in a minute, and really want to take the easy way out, as Rory said, and just take the money. Own that. But don't come back to me and say this is all about competition because it's not. There is no competition, and that's where I stand. It, it reminds me of somebody was asking me and I was trying to say, I think the quality of the golf, so what we've seen so far may, may suffer to your point, trying to play less guys who have talked about yep. both DJ and Louis Eustace. I've talked about retiring by the time they're 45. Um, same with Hudson Swafford, right? I mean, he, he's, he talked about, he wants to exit the game around that age. It strikes me as a difference between the NBA during the regular season versus the NBA during the postseason. The live is NBA during the regular season where guys kind of play defense if it's against a rival or they need a you know, big game because somebody was talking trash on social media. PGA Tour is the NBA during the playoffs where you're, you're fighting to survive and you're yep. fighting to make the cut and you eat what you kill kind of deal. And that just sharpens the blade if, if you're playing on the PGA Tour and that's the case you're trying to make the cut every week. So I'm with you on where we may end up in terms of the com the the level of competition but some of the names that are starting to bubble up of guys who m might be headed over to the live uh, it, to me it's a little bit concerning like more like morikawa again this is total speculation total no, speculation I, I will read you a tweet that he put out this morning okay this good morning. i hope I'll it's saying here here is from his account okay to state for the record once again you all, all, you all are absolutely wrong. I've said it since February at Riviera that I'm here to stay on the PGA Tour and nothing has changed. Good. Now, excuse me, I've got to get some cereal to pour in my milk. Good, good. Because I like this guy. And he is a guy you do go to tournaments to watch. 100%. And he also sets the barometer for the young players of, hey, this is if you want to have legacy and you want to play with the best, you know, right now, here's where you go.
And hopefully that's where it stays. Hopefully so. And hopefully a lot of these guys that call more cow have gone to talk to guys like Rory McIlroy, because I'm telling you, and I, I've, I've been successful in my career, but certainly haven't made millions and millions of dollars, but I've been around guys that have made millions and millions of dollars. And the one thing we don't talk about ever when we're in the moment competing or doing whatever it is, a show or whatever, is we don't talk about, well, I've made this much money, so I'm just going to sit and do nothing. No, because you love to do it. You love to do it. And so how long is it going to be before some of these guys that only play eight times a year are sitting around going, man, nobody's paying attention to me. Mm-hmm. Oh, nobody, no, nobody's watching me. I'm getting no attention. Well, because you're not a star and you never were a star for some of them. Now, some of them are. Yeah, but- I never I never once thought about money while I was playing a professional golf event. Not once. Thank you. Thank you. And there's no way that fast. Zalatoris and Fitzpatrick are coming down the stretch going, oh, that putt's going to cost me. You know, come on. Come on. I'm so tired of people on Twitter, too. Just just not even just coming at me. Just the people that have never been in the space, that have never been inside the ropes, have never been anywhere at the level that we do it, whether it's TV or golf, to just say, oh, I just take the money. Anybody would do it. It's so much deeper than that, especially. And for a guy like Colin Morikawa or Rory, these guys are making tens of millions of dollars already every single year. How much do you need? How much do you need? That's my only thing. We will get to the financial markets because Lord knows I need some help. I mean, just panic job. Spend an hour with Danny Moses inside the ropes of the U.S. Open. Next thing I know, I'm just full on selling everything. Sell the house, sell the cars. Oh, sell my Bitcoin. I can't An hour it. with Danny Moses? Oh, it was awesome. This guy's such a dude. Well, I'll tell you more about it offline, but he is such a dude. I love me some Danny Moses. Yeah, he got, <laughs> he got his tickets, by the way, through a, a charity auction with John Daly. So you know how much fun he was having. Hey, before so, we do get by, there's a, there's a button somewhere on here. Go ahead and push it. Like us. You can add your comments, any questions that you have. You know how we roll. We're going to answer it on air. Uh, Coach. Yes. You've been good this year. Your picks have been absolutely outstanding. If you've been following along, breaking even, you've been making some money. You've been getting some pay dirt off of coaches' picks. Uh, can you just kind of look into the future for me a little bit? Yeah, Offer I'm me sure. some some money makeups? You know, I know. I, every time you ask me to do a little bit more, Sometimes I just sit back and I think and I look into my crystal ball and there's a very big event this week. And for those people who don't know what that event is, it's the NBA 2022 draft. Now, there's been a lot of movement in the markets, but the reason people come to breaking even with Ned Michaels is to get the sharpest of the advice That's and you. there's a little man that would be me who just left duke his last name is panchero right there's a big seven foot dude named chet holmgren he's coming out of gonzaga he should be the number one pick but guess what he's not going to be so for people who are trying to figure out who do i bet on chet holmgren he wants to go to the thunder he has not participated ned in any of the medical stuff that the nba likes the players to do he hasn't given any of his medical reports out. That's a big red flag. Mm-hmm. And Chero as the number one pick at plus 400. And he will go to the Orlando Magic on Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern ESPN. And for the first time on ABC, you're welcome. Think he'll play defense? Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and no would be the answer there. Plus 400 for the number one pick. That's he easy was money. 100 about two weeks ago. So if you got him two weeks ago, you got him at plus 1800. But all these reports have started to come in, all these behind the scenes reports. And Chet Holmgren, he's like a Kevin Durant. I think he's going to be an all timer. So you're going to see a lot of the stuff in 15 years, Ned, when they say, like with Michael Jordan, the teams that skipped on that dude. You're going to see that about Chet Holmgren. I promise you. I promise you. I promise you, if you go down to Mississippi, <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to have a good time. <laughs> I will you're promise kidding. you that. <laughs> I mean, I, you know what's funny is up in, in Boston for the U.S. Open, on Sunday we had toboggan caps on. We had pullovers on. We had sweaters. It was 54 degrees and a cold northern wind, Coach. Down in the south, it was 115 in Memphis, it was 100 in Nashville. You could get down the coast of Mississippi, get near the water, cool yourself off. If you wanted to, you could go into some of those casinos, sling some cards. You could have put money on Matthew Fitzpatrick 
at the sports book. And then you can have a great dinner. You can play a lot of golf. And right there in that whole area, that Biloxi area, you can go to a baseball game, see concerts. That's where I'm taking my next vacation. I can promise you that. Visit Mississippi.org. So we're going to let Coach just ease his way out of here as Guy Adami slides in. And if it's not his normal jovial self, Guy's no, having I'm a little, good, Ned. A little... <laughs> I'm good, man. Back pain ain't going to slow me down. How you doing? You know, uh, I'm tired from the United States Open, but I'm more irritated that I have regained my crown as a maybe the worst trader, moron trader in the world. Uh, I, again, I spent this nice time with Danny Moses early on Saturday at the United States Open. And um, I left feeling a little bit uh, unsure of things. Mm -hmm. So I end up selling my Bitcoin at right around like 17.5 or something. Basically when it bottomed. Like that, again, that's what you do when you're the worst at something. And so now I don't know what to do. So tell me what you think about Bitcoin because you have talked about it over the past <clears throat> couple of shows. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. First of all, I think we've all been there for sure. So don't beat yourself up because you, as you know, it doesn't do any good. I and mean, we've all made those mistakes and emotion gets the better of us all the time. And I know what Danny's views are on Bitcoin, but let's talk about it real quick. And Jacob's put on a great chart. Again, and just to go back in time a little bit, if you do recall, Bitcoin topped out back in November around 66,000 or so, right around the same time the Federal Reserve in the United States pivoted. They pivoted from being extraordinarily accommodative, keeping rates low, adding liquidity to the system. And they obviously did the pivot to then fight inflation. So, for me, Ned, it's no surprise that Bitcoin topped out around the same time the Fed tried to get responsible. And I say that because I do think Bitcoin was born out of this fear in 2012 or thereabouts that central banks were running amok and this was sort of a play against the fiat currency. With that said, this final leg lower in Bitcoin, and I think it did trade down to about 17,500 or so on Saturday or Sunday. I'm not sure exactly when. It doesn't particularly matter. But it's not coincidental that you know, it comes on the heels of the Swiss National Bank earlier last week, announcing a pretty surprise rate hike by them. So you have all these central banks now around the world raising rates, trying to be responsible. And I think that's one of the main reasons that Bitcoin has come under pressure. Now, today you'll see it's up some 4000 or so dollars from that bottom. You'd be like, well, what the hell is going on? And I think it's not coincidental that one of the Fed governors said, hey, wait a second, uh, we're probably closer to ending this QT quantitative tightening cycle uh, than people think. And I think that's gotten Bitcoin back off the mat. But I'll say this, the time to own Bitcoin again, and it's going to happen, is when central banks around the world pivot from their pivot. In other words, go from being very responsible to try to being as very aggressive and, in my opinion, irresponsible as they were for years. So a couple of questions there. Uh, give us a timeline because I am from what I've read and from doing the show with you all, I believe that they're going to pivot at some yep. point. They're going to have yep. to correct path a little bit. So talk to me about a timeline on that. And then second, in talking throughout the show, listening to on the tape and the market calls, which by the way, I absolutely love those that y'all do. Again, if you're not watching or listening to market call, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you all have talked about gold, especially you guys talked about yep. gold has some legs up in your opinion. So don't they kind of go hand in hand? Gold, if the Fed pivots, is going to skyrocket and Bitcoin the same? Yeah, I think in this, ca I think in this case, Ned, you make a good point. Now, they have obviously, they've coupled, they've decoupled numerous times over the years. And quite frankly, I haven't really been able to figure out the reasons why. I think the reason why gold came off as aggressively as it did as well is because gold was an inflation hedge. Well, when gold was going higher last summer, it was doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Gold was sniffing out inflation long before the Fed said, hey, wait a second, inflation's a problem. And then when all these central banks realized it was a problem, they had to combat it, that obviously put the top in, in gold. So that sort of makes sense. Now, to your point, I agree with you. I do think this Fed is going to pivot again. I just don't know the time frame. My sense is it's going to be somewhere prior to the midterm elections, if I had a guess. So what does that make? It's sort of September, October. So you know, three or four months from now, because if the markets continue to sell off uh, inflation is still a problem, this administration and Democrats specifically are going to be fighting a pretty uphill battle to keep their seats in the House, the Senate, and obviously looking to 2024. So my instincts suggest that if things continue to slide and get worse on the market front, you will see that Fed pivot sometime in the fall. If that happens, Bitcoin goes down it goes to what? 
If the no, I see. I disagree with you. I think if this Fed then reverses again and gets no, more but accommodative in the, in the time before oh, it in pivots. The inter, I'm sorry, I didn't understand yeah. the question. So in the in the intermediate term, if inflation is obviously still a concern and they're going to still be somewhat dogmatic in their approach in terms of hey, wait a second, you know, we're really uh, steadfast in our belief that we need to fight this. Look, seventeen thousand five hundred actually made sense for a lot of different reasons. You go back sort of December 2018-ish, and if you recall, Bitcoin topped out around those levels. So past resistance becomes support. But there are other people out there that think it can go significantly lower from there. I'll say this, um, and I'm not looking to play stock market, and I'm obviously, it's, everybody's in a different situation, but my sense is if you have a long-term view, and if you do think central banks are going to once again be irresponsible and pivot from this inflation fighting stance. You know, I think we're within a few thousand dollars of the low of Bitcoin. I don't know if I feel good about that. No, I, I'm not. Oh I'm sorry, Ned. I'm trying to. I'm trying to guide you to the light. <laughs> oh, it's it's a long tunnel right now. I can just about see the light. And again, just to clarify, if the pe the Fed does pivot, you think gold goes up yeah, with the pivot? I do, because I think that's going to be them throwing in the towel. I think they're going to say, you know, we tried, obviously, unsuccessfully, because they're fighting a battle on a number of different fronts. You know, they're trying to keep the economy chugging. They obviously don't want a recession, which I understand. That's probably a conversation for another time. And at the same time, they're trying to fight inflation. It's gotten completely out of hand. You know, they were longing for 2% inflation for so long, and then they got 8.5%. And quite frankly, Ned, and I'm sure your viewers and listeners know this as well, Inflation is much higher than that if you really measured it properly. So they're in for a battle with this one. But if markets continue to deteriorate, people continue to do, you know, companies, you're seeing it all around now. Layoffs are coming. People are trying to be more, I think, responsible in the way they spend money. That's going to force their hand once again. So they've created this situation when I say they, central bankers, specifically our Federal Reserve. And I don't think they have an easy way out. So when we start talking about oil and my favorite, O-I-H. Yeah, where is that today? I mean, that's been volatile as hell, man. Incredible. Well, I got back in at 300. Again, I've already made nice money off of it. Uh, and you've had some terrific calls on that. But I got back in at 300 thinking, okay, we're looking at yeah. hopefully 20%. It's gone down now below that support yeah, of 245. And, I, and again, just like Bitcoin, I kind of panicked and sold a lot of it at a loss. So... Uh, yeah, it looked no, like a double it. top, this, and again, there were a lot of reasons, you know, but hit feel, me with what you think. Listen, and I feel bad. Listen, I'm definitely responsible for this because- No, you know, no, you're not allowed to feel bad about these things. But You're if, giving information, and I'm making the decision, no, and, and Jacob's our listeners to are. to do something for me. So if you continue to sort of stretch this out, and stretch it out even more, because I think it's important to see where it is now, but look at where OIH has been over the years. And right. you look at this and say, well, wait a second. Um, although we look like we're making new all-time highs, the reality is- we're not even close. So 245 was my line in the sand. Obviously, we traded below that. I think we got down to 232 or something. As you know, once again, not an exact science, and I get it, and I understand the discipline suggests that below 245 you get out. But I, again, I think people are underestimating the power of oil here. And as much as they want to downplay it, as much as they want to sort of jawbone it lower, they being the administration and other people, I think the fundamentals are in place for oil to go higher. I was surprised the OIH didn't get – significantly higher than the highs we saw back in March. I think we got to, what, 320 or so. But here we are, very volatile. But once again, at this, let's just call it 245, 245 because I think that's where it's trading as we speak. You know, the stocks that comprise that are really cheap fundamentally. So this, to me, is a good entry point. I understand that it got through my level. But again, as you know, there are no exact sciences in this thing. I asked Danny Moses uh, about their discussion, your discussion with Porter and Vinny and talking about Tesla and being short on it. And I said, well, you know, if I wanted to short it, what do I do? And he said, buy puts. <laughs> oh, thanks, genius. But I am interested in this is more of a kind of a macro question specific to Tesla. But I guess in general, how far out are you looking for something like Tesla? And then how do you determine what price the strike price and the value yeah, of it. And that's a that's big a question. question. I mean, there's but, so many things embedded in that when you talk about options. I mean, how far out do you look? Well, a lot of times you want to look out towards events. What does that mean? Well, what is the next event for Tesla? And my sense is the next event's going to come in the form of earnings release, probably sometimes next month. I don't have it up in front of me, but 
So the earnings release will be an event. So you want to get the be- you want to give yourself time where you capture that event. So if you think Tesla's quarter is not going to be up to snuff and you want to play it on the short side vis-a-vis puts, you better make sure the expiration date of those puts are after they report on earnings, if that makes sense. Because you don't want to buy puts that expire before, have them report, and then have the stock move after the event. So take that into consideration. In terms of strike price, you know, let price be your guide in terms of where the stock has been. That 600 level has been support a couple of times. That makes sense. So if you wanted to sort of um, have a, an opinion vis-a-vis puts and you think it's going lower, again, not having seen where Tesla Vol is right now, mm-hmm. my sense is probably it's pretty elevated if you wanted to buy puts, but I'll play the game with you. You would look at something like an August, whatever, $600 put, because I think that gives you enough time. And then from a macro point of view, for some reason, I'm feeling better about things. Maybe I'm still riding high from the United States Open, Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to get your thoughts on it. You had that 3750 call. Just overview. How are you feeling and where are we going? So I'm Jacob put up an S&P chart. We've actually talked about this last week. The fact that I thought, all right, we've exhausted ourselves to the downside. And now I think there's room still for a bounce and main being still in this bear market channel that we find ourselves in. I said it on fast money last week. I think I said it on, on the tape with the guys that although I'm bearish overall sort of got to my levels and now I'm looking for a bounce. So I actually think the market can bounce to the S and P call it 4,000 or so. So that's some 250 ish handles away. So call it a six or 7% move to the upside before we, in my opinion, take the next leg lower. I do think at some point we trade 3,200 or so in the S&P. I I don't want to say it's a foregone conclusion because there are no foregone conclusions, but it makes sense to me in terms of levels. But I think we can get to 4,000 first. It makes sense given what IWM went down to its pre-COVID highs. Mm -hmm. Everything is kind of touching back to those pre-COVID highs. So why would the S&P be spared? That's right. I think that's exactly right. And remember, we're coming into an earnings seasons where I think I, I think people expectations are way too high. I mean, if you just look around the landscape, people are starting to cut back in a major way and it might not manifest itself in the earnings that are released. But I think it might manifest itself in the guidance going forward. When should I get back into Apple? Well, it got down to about what? I think I got down to 131 or so, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, that's about right. And when you say get back in, you mean in terms of your put position? No, in terms of in terms of buying for long, thinking okay, it's discounted enough. The price is uh, a time to yeah. purchase. Well, if that's a good question, so if I'm right, and it's a big if, if I'm right in my S and P assertion, I think one of the la- one of the things that can get us there is probably Apple coming out and sort of guiding lower, or you know maybe missing the quarter entirely. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility, given again the backdrop. So. My level is sort of somewhere between 120 and 125 to get in. And then once you get in at those levels, I think it's one of those things where you sort of close your eyes and say, all right, this was a, I want to call it generational because that's a dumb word, but this was a great opportunity in a stock that I've been looking to buy for years. You know, I'm able to get it at probably at that point, almost a 40% discount to the prior all time high we saw. I want to say December, January of last or December of last year, January of this year. Disney, you're still high on. I'm, I'm in at you roughly did a good job, 100. Though, Ned. Yeah. You know, you got out, you got long, you sold it out. You said, you know what, if I'm bearish in a broader market, Disney's not going to be spare, spared. You were right. What did it get down to? 94 or something now. Right. Where is Disney at? Yeah, 95. So well done by you. Look, I still think just valuation alone, Disney's worth a look. And you go longer term chart, you'll see, you know, these are levels that we found support in over the years. But you can understand, again, if the economy is slowing, uh, why people might put off that trip to Disney. And you can understand how they'd be under pressure. With that said, I mean, we've effectively round tripped the move we saw from early 2020, obviously made new all-time highs when everything was raging. Now we've given the entire move back. It's just surprising to me that it's almost down to where it was in COVID. I mean, it's yeah. not that far away, 10 it's to 15 It's pretty remarkable, right? It, it yeah. is remarkable, yeah. Um, you know, my favorite part of the show, Guy. Oh, it is. are we going to do it? Because I don't know. But I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Always I'm ready. ready. Roll it. Hey, you guys. <laughs> I don't have coach here to make fun of me, but I'll say this. What's really interesting about baseball, um, they say you play 162 games in a season, which you know, Ned. 
And the, the common theme is out of those first hundred games or out of a hundred games, you're going to win 50 and you're going to lose 50. And it's what you do in the other 62 that separates you from the pack. Well, as we sit here right now, the Yankees of New York are 50 and 17. It's really a remarkable start. And if you think about it, if you do the math, if they play at this clip the rest of the year, not only they're not going to lose 50 games, they might only lose 42 games. It might be one of those seasons that just sort of mark for your calendar th things that never have happened before. I think the Seattle Mariners, I think, had the all-time regular season win total. I think it was 118. This Yankee team might surpass it. They do everything right. Watched the game last night, a game that, you know what? They had every opportunity to lose once Garrett Cole gave up his no-hitter but they found a way to win. This team, Ned Michaels, is finding a way to win, and that's my mini rant for the day. That's great. That's great, you know. I always root for the Yankees as a Braves fan. Always root for the Yankees. I'm hoping they go 0-50 in the next 50 games. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. No. That one I can almost guarantee you. They're, they're a good play. baseball team, a good baseball team. And you're a good man for joining us, as always, Guy Dami, we'll see you next week on Breaking Even.